The proceeding will start shortly. 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 The proceeding will start shortly.
The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly.
The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. Order, order, and thank you for coming in today to talk to us about tackling online abuse. Um, I have to say, I'm sorry that there aren't more members here today, um, but several members of the committee are sitting on public bill committees that are meeting at the same time. Um, but this session marks the resumption of the committee's inquiry into this topic. It's obviously under heavy scrutiny at the moment um, in Parliament across a number of committees. Um, and comes at a good time as well following the government's publication of the draft online safety bill earlier this year. Um, so we heard evidence from petitioners last year about the impact of online abuse on them and their families. But it's clear that the action is needed on this issue and it's only become more urgent since we have taken that evidence and heard from those petitioners. But before we launch into our questions for you today, can I please just ask you to briefly introduce yourselves? I'll, I'll, start, I'll go from the left. Danny? I'm Danny Stone. I'm the Chief Executive of the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust. It's a charity which works to educate decision makers about anti-Semitism. Thank you, Nancy. My name is Nancy Kelly, I'm the Chief Exec of Stonewall, we're an LGBTQ plus rights organisation that works for the rights of LGBT people here in the UK and around the world. And Matthew? I'm Matthew Harrison, I'm the Public Affairs and Parliamentary Manager at MENCAP. Uh, we're there to support the 1.5 million people with a loan disability in the UK to access better healthcare services, care services, employment and education. Uh, we also provide direct support to over 5,000 people with a loan disability. Thank you. And before we start as well, I should also declare that I co-chair the all-party parliamentary group on anti-Semitism, for which the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust acts as the group secretariat. Um, so I'll take the chair's privilege by asking the first question today. Um, sadly, we know that the communities that your organisations um, campaign on behalf of are frequent targets of online abuse. Um, and, you know, we did hear very powerful testimony from petitioners who really want to see uh, change in this area. But can you briefly set out the impact that this has had on the recipients that you're here to represent this abuse? Yeah, um, well, firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you. Um, it's always good to be able to highlight the issues um, and so so look anti-semitism online is widespread and pervasive 
Um, the numbers of incidents have risen. Uh, 2017, the I should say the Community Security Trust, another charity, the CST, an excellent organization, um, collects data. So we know that in 2017, there were 247 of the 1,300 incidents were online. And these are incidents which are proactively reported to the CSC. They don't go searching for anti-Semitism online, they'd be there forever. Um, but it was 18% of the incidents in 2017. By 2020, we're up to 38% of the incidents. So, you know, regularly now about 40% of the incidents. And, and I say incidents, you know, this, this ranges. Some of that is criminal behavior. Um, some of it is, is abusive and discriminatory, death threats, um, intimidation of people in public positions in public life has been well documented. Um, we, we've seen, I mean, we've seen conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories that lead to real world harms. And we've seen um, particularly abuse of Jewish women um, so we see intersectional abuse, and if there's an opportunity, I'll, I'll happily talk, talk more about that. Um, but it ranges, and we know that there is poor enforcement across the platforms. Um, we also know specifically on alternative, so-called alternative platforms, or smaller platforms. Uh, some of them are designed for harm, and some of them have significant levels of abuse. Um, Gab is a kind of, a, I suppose, an anti-Semitic Twitter, and it might, might be best to characterise it like that. Um, the Brits or Brit fan group had 4,000 members, 1,000 posts per day, including anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. So it isn't just the Twitter and the Facebooks of this world. There is a range of harms occurring across a range of different platforms. It's sinister. We've got a problem, and it's, at the moment, completely unregulated, and so something needs to be done. Thank you. Um, so I guess I would start by saying that um, the digital world also brings enormous benefits to LGBTQ plus people, particularly those of us that live in unsupported homes, unsupported communities or hostile environments. And so there's a real balance here in terms of the benefits of online participation for LGBTQ plus people in particular. But it's also very, very clear that online harm has a devastating impact on LGBTQ plus people. So in terms of what that looks like um, on a day-to-day -day basis for kind of ordinary LGBTQ plus people, um, if you look at our sister organisation Gallup's online hate report, you see that a very high proportion of people that have experienced online harm. So nearly 100% of us have been insulted. Um, very high percentages, so 63% of people had been threatened with physical violence, 41% of people who'd experienced online hate had experienced threats of sexual assault, 39% um, had experienced death threats. So this is quite a, a kind of severe form of online abuse that, that we see. And the prevalence is very high. So if you look at um, international studies, so you look at something like the, the Pew Research Centre in, uh, in the US does a, a state of online harassment report, it will show you that lesbian and gay and bisexual adults um, are very likely, about 70% of us, have encountered online harassment and that's much much higher it's only about four in ten straight adults so it's much much higher than for the straight population and as the committee will know the trans community um, has really faced kind of devastating escalating abuse so we can look at um, 2019 research from Ditch the Label and, and Brandwatch that looked at 10 million posts and 1.5 million of them were uh, severe transphobic content. So, so all of our community, including here in the UK, experience this, this very high prevalence of abuse. And I think that in terms of the impact that has, you will see impacts that will be probably very similar across our, all of our groups about mental health, about people's confidence participating, not just digitally, but in the real world. But also for LGBTQ plus people, you will see um, some very direct um, uh, impacts beyond that. So being outed and being doxxed are both very common forms of online abuse for our community and that can mean LGBTQ plus people becoming homeless, um, losing their job or feeling like they need to lose, that feeling like they need to leave their job um, or feeling like they need to leave their community or their church. So um, so forms of abuse that we might think of as purely digital for our community very quickly um, can have uh, re very major real-life impacts. Okay, Matthew. So 
No, I, I suppose I'd start by putting it in context. You know, people with learning disabilities face uh, social isolation and stigma in the real world, and that very much carries across into um, the digital environment and digital world. Um, in terms of sort of bullying, uh, harms, all of this carried out, um, it's already high prevalence in the real mm -hmm. world. So, I mean, one in three people with disabilities told us that bullying is one of the things they fear most before they leave the house. And unfortunately, as I said, this is carried across into um, the online sphere. So, uh, by the Cheshire and United Response found in 2019-20 that disability uh, hate crimes online went up 52%. And we suspect it's probably increased in the last year just because of the pandemic and people being forced to socialise more and more um, on the digital sort of world or social media platforms. Um, and it does have a knock-on effect whether that's happening in the real world or online as well. As I said, this group really faces high levels of social isolation um, and experiencing online harms can lead to increased levels of isolation, seclusion in their own home. And we know that that impacts life opportunities, whether that's um, employment, socialising. We also know that it actually has an impact on a person's physical health as well. So these are very, very much um, real world impacts, um, even though it seems like you know, they're just a, a tweet or a post. Um, they do actually impact people's lives and wellbeings and health. So um, I wanted to ask, I mean, obviously you've all painted quite a challenging picture. You know, what would you say are the most important issues to address if we're to tackle um, the, the abuse and the impact that you're describing? Um, who wants to go first? Do you want to go back to you, Danny, since you've had the yeah. longest time in between? Sure. Um, well, if we're looking, if we look, the online safety bill is, is, is the main game in town now. And um, my view is that at the moment, some of the duties as drafted are too specific. Um, so the, it, it creates different duties on platforms to deal with uh, illegal content in respect, in respect of adults and children and then legal but harmful content but only for certain types of platform um, and with uh, specific exemptions. So for example search is exempt from addressing legal but harmful content and where legal but harmful content is addressed uh, the companies or platforms that are involved have only to have terms and conditions that deal with the harms, that's it, that, that's the wording. Um, so in my view, I think there should be a general, a more general foundational duty of care the, that comes either above or in, instead of those um, various uh, duties. I think that we need stronger penalties, um, and again, I'd be happy to talk more about this, but at the moment, um, there is not really a proper uh, senior manager liability structure in the bill. There is a sort of one, but not a, not a full one, in my view. Um, I think that we should also we should also ensure that anonymity is dealt with. At the moment, there is no reference to anonymity in the bill. There's been lots of discussion about this. I've got particular ideas about how I think that could be dealt with uh, in a way that balances respective uh, freedoms and, uh, and interests. Um, and so those, those, are, those are the kind of the, the top ones, I, I would say, that, that would be helpful in respect to the bill. Can I just probe that slightly? Um, you talked about having sort of an underlying or a foundational, um, or you might call it an overarching duty of care. Um, but, you know, you all, you, you all described various harms and, and, and abuse that is experienced. But do you think that we successfully or have a clear enough picture of, of how to establish the harm in order to establish the duty of care. Do you think we have um, a clear enough picture? Do you think we're recording the harm sufficiently in order to be able to um, implement the duty of care? It, at the moment, it's slightly difficult to say because if, if one listens to the, um, Francis Haugen, the, the Facebook whistleblower, she was pretty clear that the data that we're being given is not accurate is based on a, an interpretation of what's being asked. So that's why some of the transparency duties that are in the bill are going to be important um, to actually try and work out what's going on. We can work off, there are various bits of, of data out there, the European Commission, for example, has some. Um, we, can, we, can ha we have a bit of an understanding, and obviously organisations like ours, CST in the anti-Semitism space, understand that. I think also harms develop um, so I think whatever we do, it will, need to be, it will need to be flexible. So there is, at the moment, the proposal is that the arms will come in secondary legislation, be listed in secondary legislation. Um, 
But yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I think the way that the bill is, is drafted at the moment, I'm relatively comfortable with it. Um, but the, I, think, I think the foundational duty of care in any event will be useful because it's kind of, it, what it does is it refocuses on systems rather than content. And that's where we need to be, is not on the specific content, but on the systems that are enabling that harmful content to be spread. I hope that answers yeah. the question. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I'll build on some of what, what Danny said and then range a bit more broadly than the online harms bill. So we completely agree about the value of having a uh, foundational duty of care and kind of really shifting responsibility to platforms to be thoughtful and to demonstrate the way in which they are providing a safer online experience. We're concerned to make sure that not only the largest platforms are covered, as is currently the case, the Category 1 um, platforms, because what we know from our community is that much of this hate is fomented on smaller platforms that would be completely unregulated under the current scheme. Obviously, regulation would need to be appropriate to the size and nature of the platform, but to leave that space um, kind of untouched in terms of um, legal but harmful content is a, a major loophole. And we've got some concerns about tightening up the definition of some of the exemptions that are currently on the face of the bill, so particularly for um, conversations of democracy importance and uh, journalistic importance and I'm happy to kind of come back to those things but very much endorse everything that Danny said I if I could just point to a couple of other issues more broadly out with the context of the bill firstly um, existing platforms can already do a much better job of enforcing their community standards that they have and they can already do a much better job of the kind of safety by design challenge so kind of picking up the the, the theme uh, uh, from from Danny around Facebook, one of the things that was very clear in the Facebook papers is to do with the algorithmic amplification of hate. Um, so for a very long time, um, angry faces were getting up-weighted in the algorithm, were getting promoted more and were associated with hateful content. So we know that there are both system-wide processes that platforms could improve right now and there are also um, individual processes, responses to complaints that platforms could improve right now. We shouldn't need to legislate to make them do it. We should hold them to account for that. And, and for those of you that have ever tried getting posts removed from a mm -hmm. platform, it is quite instructive what is not considered to be uh, against community standards. And then just to point to just a last issue and then and, and hand to my colleague, Matthew. Um, I think a lot of people concerned about online safety are rightly concerned about creating positive online citizens, so education for young people, and, and I think we would agree that that's really important. However, um, it's equally if not more important to understand that a lot of the online hate we see is being produced by a very small number of people who've become very radicalised and often are expressing that hate across multiple groups. There's you know, huge overlaps between anti-Semitism and homophobia and transphobia and ableist abuse and racism of all sorts. So I think it's really important to think about what de-radicalization looks like in the space of online hate and how we both set up systems and set up supportive programs that, that prevent people becoming prolific producers and amplifiers of hate online. No, I don't find it really hard to disagree with quite a lot of what my colleagues have said here. Um, on the online safety bill, um, I would definitely agree about the duty of care. I think that's something that we'd, we would like to see put back in. And we have those same concerns about some of the ambiguities in the bill around those terms of uh, legal but harmful contents. Um, one particular phrase that concerns us is uh, ordinary sensibilities, and who is the provider of said ordinary sensibilities. Um, and as it was sort of highlighted, Quite a lot of the bill is being left to codes of practice, being left to secondary legislation, um, to the Secretary of State's strategic priorities, and that's the official term. So we'd like to see some of those uh, ambiguities tied, or I guess um, ironed out is probably the better phrase for that. Um, and obviously, but we do welcome the actual bill itself in terms of actually bringing enforcement industry standards. So that's one I think has been covered quite a bit. And the second is. Um, some of the Law Commission's current work looking at hate crime and offensive communications laws. 
um, which seem to be moving in the right direction, which the Royal Commission is suggesting. So I think that's something that actually needs to be looked at the same time as the online safety bill, because they do interplay between each other. Um, and I think sometimes the reforming of those laws is actually overlooked. Thank you. So I was going to bring Christina in, who wants to ask, um, I think, a bit about anonymity. Um, but first of all, I think Tonya was going to follow up on some of those issues raised. Yeah, well, one of the things I, I, I wanted to ask was, do, do you all accept that conversations about public policy and lawmaking should not be unduly censored on online forums? Um, I, I guess you all nod in. I'll start with Danny. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I've always been of the view that kind of freedom of speech is fundamental to who we are in Britain. That that kind of, and particularly, of course, in, in policy circles, there needs to be the freedom to to have difficult conversations. I think yeah. responsibly to have difficult conversations, and in fact, to lead public debate. I mean, that was some of the major concerns about anti-Semitism was obviously that there were people in public positions who were not talking responsibly. So it's about having that a proper thorough debate having a responsible one um, so I don't I don't believe in censorship censorship in that sense um, but I, at the moment in the bill it talks about um, content of democratic importance and there's an exemption for that but I worry that that again as, as colleagues were saying is not carefully defined and so what what will that look like and who will get the protections there and is there the potential for those seeking to cause harm deliberately to get those protections. I, I completely agree with everything Danny said, and maybe if it's helpful, I can give an example of a public policy conversation that, that can cross the line that, that we were involved with in Stonewall. So um, we've, we were set up to advocate for LGBTQ plus inclusion in schools, kind of repeal of section 28 30 years ago, and we still work on LGBTQ inclusion in schools today. And there is a very wide range of views about what relationships and sex education should look like in schools, um, including a very wide range of important views that are very different from mine and my organisations that absolutely should be able to be expressed. One of the things that happens when you have a public policy debate about LGBTQ uh, inclusion in schools and sex and relationships education is you have all of that debate and you also have people calling... Um, lesbian, gay, bi and trans people paedophiles as part of their argument. I think the abusive part shouldn't be covered by an exemption but somebody for instance who um, absolutely disagrees with the idea that children should be talked to about sexuality at all or on religious or secular grounds should absolutely be able to express all of those things. So I think it's, it's about how do you make it possible for people to exercise, absolutely exercise their rights to free speech without straying into exercising those rights in a way that are directly abusive of, in this case, minority groups. Okay. Matthew, if to No, I, I think that's a good point. I think, yeah, we are obviously very much <laughs> don't want to censor um, reasonable views, I would say, but that's sort of direct targeted, um, prejudiced um, harms or, or hatred is something that does need to be tackled. And I think there was a good point about the online safety bill and those terms of journalistic content and democratic importance. Um, and I sort of was racking my brain of a situation where um, an online sort of harmful or hateful comment would actually sort of fall under either of those terms. So I think it is about having that reasonable approach. Um, and I think, yeah, as so it's a small, very small minority of people who do cross that line. Mm -hmm. And I think the majority of people realize who's crossed the line and, and what is crossing the line. So I think we can have that balance, but it is a perpetual tension, I think, when you talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I hope the online safety bill isn't just a one-off. It's something that requires that um, renewed discussions to actually keep up with times, keep up with say, the changes in language, changes in attitudes, um, societal changes. So I'd say it's, yeah, it's something we should always keep an eye on, but I think there is a balance that the majority can find. If, if I could just add, sorry, I think we often talk about this as if the two ideas, kind of protection and safety online and free speech online, are in tension, and indeed they can be, but they aren't always. So uh, the example that, that Matthew gave, the example that Danny gave, the examples that I've given, 
you know, having a safer online space is a precondition for all of the groups we represent to be able to participate and express their own free speech rights. Um, and indeed, some of the issues around anonymity for LGBTQ plus people are about being able to express their views as well. So I think it's important to think also about the way in which a kind of more secure online environment makes it possible for people to express themselves. Mm. Which leads us very nicely into, I think, what Christina wants to ask you about. Thank you, Chair. Um, I apologise for my voice. I, I've lost it. Uh, some of my friends have been waiting years for this to happen. Um, <laughs> uh, we've received uh, several petitions that have suggested that uh, being able to post anonymously online encourages abusive behaviour. Is this something you found? I mean, yes, yes, it does, um, is, the answer, is the direct answer. And there are various studies that, that can be referenced that would show that people have less inhibition when they're anonymous and that they will post in a more harmful way or a more hateful way. Um, and we know that the data that I have is the, the Community Security Trust for the month of October 2020, 40% of the online incidents uh, in that month were from anonymous accounts. And that may have been... Um, voice recordings, uh, anonymous usernames, and obviously more broadly we know about the QAnon movement and the fact that, that anonymity emboldens people to act in a harmful way. Now, my view is that our organisation has the most balanced and um, sensible approach to all of this, uh, which is that we are not calling for a ban on anonymity. We recognise the value. You know, Stonewall uh, Nancy has spoken about the importance of anonymity, and uh, we certainly recognise that there, that it must be there for certain people, that it it, there are important protections that an anonymity provides. However, there are things that we might be able to do through the bill that would ensure safety for people so that there isn't the abuse that we see um, using, using the shield of anonymity. So, for example, a simple thing to do would be to amend section 61, I think it is, of the bill in respect of the risk assessments that companies do. Anonymity is a risk. We know it's a risk. We can prove it's a risk. Shouldn't a company have to risk assess how it addresses that risk, what it is that it puts in place to ensure that anon anonymous abuse doesn't happen? And the other thing that I think we may be able to do, and I'm talking to various um, solicitors and barristers at the moment, is what are the police power? In certain cases, the police can demand revelation of identity in respect to, say, terrorism, right? There are production orders. Well, are those working effectively? We know from our initial discussions with police that the platforms are patchy in their responses to, to police. I think it's fair to say that they're kind of, they're, the way in which they respond is not consistent. So might there be a way to look at police powers? What are the police powers that need underlining through the bill that could um, be restated or, or move, taken across from that terrorism or child sexual exploitation and abuse space and effectively mirrored in respect of threats? And ultimately, my view is that the platforms should be liable. If they can't provide the information, then there needs to be some liability. It cannot be down to you know, me or our organisation, there's a platform liability. If you can't show us who's behaving in a criminal way on your platform, then you should be liable for that. Um, I would certainly agree with Danny that there's ample, ample evidence that anonymity contributes to severity of harm and proliferation of harm, and I don't think anybody agrees with or disagrees with that at all. I think the, the note of caution we would sound about some of the approaches to dealing with online anonymity is about the potential impact on LGBTQ people's ability to participate online. So in the case of forms of identity verification that display at least some personal information, parts of real names, etc., which which gets um, an location, <laughs> which is one of the proposals that, that um, people talk about. Um, that would create a very direct risk of harm. So if you think back to the kinds of impacts I talked about, being outed, being doxxed, are themselves harmful for LGBTQ plus people, including here in the UK, if you come from a socially or religiously conservative family community background or just don't want to be out. So that, that visible verification would really um, prohibit uh, parts of our community being able to fu fully participate online. When you think about kind of people talk about banking, know your own customer, sort of middle middleware approaches, that obviously mitigates that risk quite a lot. But I think it's very important to think about the amount of personal data that goes into those approaches. So um, I checked this morning if you want a gov.uk 
Verify account, you are getting credit checked on a credit check agency, you're providing photographic ID, you're providing quite a lot of personal ID to verify your identity. That feels proportionate if you're talking about a bank account or your benefits payment or paying taxes. It's a lot of personal identification to hand over to do an Instagram post. And we think that that's fairly likely to have a chilling effect on LGBTQ people's participation or being out online. And we know that particularly for people from our community that come from those more conservative, less inclusive communities or backgrounds, sometimes online is the main place they can be their full selves. So, so we think there's a lot to think through in terms of how you would identity verify in a way that didn't raise all of those risks for LGBTQ plus people. I, I think I agree a lot with what Nancy says and uh, I guess we look at it through the lens of um, people with learning disabilities and our main concern or what we're thinking through whenever we hear of various proposals and suggestions is, is it accessible to people with learning disabilities? They say there's a lot of, for some opening a bank account, I've said quite a lot of ID and we know that people with learning disabilities have lower levels of ownership of most forms of ID. So um, should we move through to sort of quite a stringent ID process, we have concerns that perhaps the system might end up excluding people with learning disabilities from having a profile. So you end up in this odd position of actually by trying to make the space, uh, sorry, the space safer, you end up excluding someone from actually using the platform. So I guess, you know, we can see the arguments on, on both sides and they're very strong arguments. Um, but what we'd like is that sort of discussion about how it actually works for users as well who aren't going on there with the intention of actually causing harms but could be uh, or fall foul of the, the regulations keeping them from them using it. Nancy, I was going to ask you a, a follow-up question but I think you've answered it. I was going to ask you, um, can we tackle misuse of anonymity online whilst while still acknowledging it's important for users who generally need need it, and if so, how do we do that? But I think it's the fear, isn't it, that yeah. you've stressed? Yeah. And so I how do we get around that? So I think, I mean, I'm I'm not a sadly for this committee a, te a technical ID verification specialist, <laughs> but I th I think the fifty four thousand dollar question is: Is there a way of having enough verification of identity that doesn't fall foul of the kinds of um, uh, barriers that Matthew is pointing to and I'm pointing to in terms of participation and you know we know that the, the forms of verification that, that get pointed to a lot in this space which tend to be things like verify or bank account opening don't meet that test we know that they involve handing over quite a lot of personal information in quite a complicated process so so I think for me, unhelpfully, we're presenting a challenge rather than a solution, which is 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 never ideal, but a, but a challenge it is nonetheless. And one of the concerns that we have, just additionally, is that given the nature of these platforms globally, if um, approaches to verifying identity were then uniformly adopted on, say, a platform such as Facebook, Twitter, etc., it would have an enormously harmful impact in. Uh, other countries. Uh, we work a lot at the minute to support LGBTQ Afghanis to, to safety. Afghan people would absolutely not be able to make of identity. So, so something that's risky in the UK becomes overwhelmingly risky if, if kind of transported to less supportive environments. Thank, thank you, Nancy. And uh, just a follow-up to Danny, really. Um, what's your views on ID clarification? Uh, on, the, on the principle of ID verification, I, I actually kind of agree with what Nancy was saying. We have to be careful, I think, about how much is, is required to verify people. Um, but as I say, I think it should be proportionately to a platform to determine how much verification it needs and that liability, and that, that risk then falls on the platform is my view. Um, I mean, there is, by the way, there is a, an interim kind of solution that's being touted, but I know Siobhan Bailey MP is running a, a campaign around um, ensuring that, that platforms allow users to only engage with verified accounts, for example, right, which wouldn't force you to be verified, but would, for example, enable individuals who only want to engage with people they know can be traced to do so. 
and that may be a way of kind of bridging the gap. I think, I think working with Clean Up the Internet. But, so there are other proposals out there which take that into account specifically. Um, my view is, yeah, we, we do need to be careful. But again, I'm not kind of I'm not the expert. I think middleware will play a solution in this. So some kind of technology that sits in between the platform and the individual. Um, but again, I would see that as the platform's responsibility to investigate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Martin, have you got some questions you want to ask? Yes, thank, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say, time is ticking. This is very, no, 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 it's a really rich session, and it's always frustrating that we haven't got all the time in the world, but it's just to bear it in mind. So I think if, if somebody has made a point, you know, obviously add to it, but um, let's get as much out of this session as we can. That, that's a, an ironic opening because I was going to comment that the, this issue has been debated quite extensively by a whole range of other committees uh, and a number of them have commented on the gap between the, the uh, community standards that the various social media companies have and the actual reality of what mm -hmm. they allow on their sites. So what, what do you think explains that gap? <laughs> I mean... Uh, La some, it's, I'm sure, a range of things. Um, sometimes it's a, a lack of numbers. You know, I mean, I remember YouTube in front of the Home Affairs Select Committee not being able to say how many moderators it had. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know. They couldn't work it out because some are, are, are occupied, are employed, excuse me, by YouTube, and some are external companies. So I think sometimes it's just it's a pure numbers thing. Sometimes the technology is not there. So we know that um, Google Safe Search was designed, um, as Google says to keep out uh, child pornography, that, that kind of explicit images. Um, the, the categories that they use at the back end to filter their pictures include racy and spoof, um, for example, the, the way they categorize them. That's pretty rudimentary in terms of its understanding of, of the kind of images that may go through the system. So there's just a, a lack of, of, of developed technology um, to, to deal with this stuff. You know, I've talked about voice technology. Um, Clubhouse, this app that, that seems to have died somewhat of a death, but it was it was a voice platform, social media platform. Well, how do we how do we regulate that? I mean, Spotify is unable to pick up quite a lot of the hateful blogs that or podcasts that appear on its site, so the technology isn't there. So I don't I, mean, I think there's a range of different things, but certainly um, just un the understanding from moderators of their own policies. I don't think is there as well, and we are not quality assuring the training for those moderators. I mean, take your pick. It could be any, it could be any of that. I'm mindful of, of not talking too much. I'll just I'll build. The, one of the things that was really striking and uh, in the kind of Facebook papers uh, dump that is also consistent, I think, in many many, I guess, whistleblow accounts of various social media platforms over the years is that there is a fundamental imbalance in power and investment within the companies. So even if the technology exists, if the technology doesn't exist, it probably doesn't exist because the ethical side of the business has been long-term underinvested in. And, and I think that that is such a kind of important facet of this, that you have uh, businesses whose entire model is based on engagement, and we know that this content drives high engagement. So there are huge incentives financial and structural incentives um, that pull in the opposite direction. And if you don't invest sufficiently and equally in ethics, in ethical technological development to counterbalance that, there is always going to be a pull that weights all of these platforms in a way that has these outcomes. That would be the only additional point I would make. I suppose the one I would make um, on top of that is probably the lack of consequences for, for not taking mm. action. And I think that's led us to the path where we're having a draft bill in front of us today um, because self-regulation has been tried and it's at the moment just not working, which has sort of bent everyone's hands towards doing that. So I think the underlying factor mm. is that self-regulation and the lack of consequences. Thank you. That, that sort of leads me on to what I'm, I'm planning to come on to next. Uh, looking at the draft online safety bill, the government's approach is to make the social media companies liable for enforcing their own rules on acceptable content. So is it really just a question of enforcement or do those rules need strengthening as well? 
I, I think, so for example, I talked about um, senior manager liability, and this was raised at PMQs the other day. We were told there'd be tough, tough sanctions. At the moment, it's two years. There's going to be a two-year gap, a, a kind of the government's um, reserving the powers. There's going to be a two-year gap, and the senior managers could be imprisoned for up to two years, but probably more likely fine for failing to produce um, information, essentially, right, transparency reports. And that's important, and that's, that's useful. I would like to see that linked to the duty of care more generally. And in banking, in the financial sector, it's seven years in prison, right? Well, in my view, seven years is pretty tough. Two years is less so. If you've been warned of a problem, you've failed repeatedly and deliberately to address it, then I think there should be a tougher sanction. And I think that fines, certainly for the larger companies, are just the cost of doing business. And everything must be applied proportionally, but, but I think that we could do more there. I would say to, to kind of, um, I would really emphasise the enforcement side of the picture, actually. If we, if we pick up the point that you were making about the existing community standards, if those standards that exist in the platform were effectively enforced um, to a kind of reasonable person's understanding of kind of no hate speech, everybody, everybody's experience of the online space will be transformed immediately. So kind of just enforcing the standards as they are would be an enormous transformative step forward for the experience of participating for all of us online. I would agree that enforcement and I said a point I made to the joint committee, it's around ensuring Ofcom has the, the knowledge, mm -hmm. um, the staff and the ability to actually enforce these rules themselves. Um, I can imagine there's a few people scratching their heads about how you go around um, regulating what are huge, huge companies that operate across the globe. And um, I think there's a lot of discussion to be had around how Ofcom can actually have the tools and resources to, to do the job that they're um, given in this bill. Uh, that, 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 that's great. So what, what mechanism should the government use to force social media companies to either enforce their current rules or strengthen them? Really? So I think I, w I would just in brief pick up some of the threads that have been in, in what Danny and, and all of us have been speaking to. So that the imposing a positive duty and regulating against that positive duty is, I think, the key here. And, and for me, one of the kind of benefits of a positive duty is it enables learning over time and it involves evolution over time. So our, both our understanding of what is legal but harmful might change, which is I think a point that Matthew was making earlier, but also our understanding of what is possible in terms of the technology, the points that Danny was making will evolve and that allows the regulator to hold platforms to account for doing, um, an, uh, doing an effective job this year and next year and the year after. So I think that thinking about that positive duty as a way of creating a requirement to adapt and to adapt to a good standard feels really powerful to me. And the media literacy strategy that accompanies it and is well funded so that we're not just talking about the platforms, we're talking about wider public, wider civil society, educating people how to engage online and how to do so, you know, with consideration to whether it be fake news or, you know, doing something in the heat of the moment, you know, understanding the way the online world works and embedding that in our education system. Yeah, I suppose the, the other crucial part as well is actually bringing social media um, companies on board with the regulations. Um, I was quite heartened to hear, um, I think it was Facebook, who said they were looking forward to the bill and the regulations and the clarity it brings. So I think there's a big job for the government um, and parliamentarians to, to try to create that sort of positive working relationship so that um, the regulations and enforcement don't feel like a, a negative but rather a positive relationship. And the, the media literacy strategy is a huge one. Um, to tackle that core issue, which is stigma and negative attitudes. So hopefully through a well-resourced and well-run media literacy campaign, in the long term we can start to remove um, the attitudes that develop over time and lead to that content and that radicalisation, as Nancy was talking about. Thanks, Martin. Tony. Thanks, Chair. Um, just something you picked to pick you up on, Danny. You spoke about um, fines and penalties, but 
what penalties you know should these companies face for breaches of a duty of care would it just be fines do you, do you want to expand on that no so in extreme i mean we have in the financial sector in health and safety um, senior managers are held responsible where there are significant breaches of a duty of care or, or, um, or responsibilities. So as I say, my view is that seven years in prison, you know, if you're looking at seven years in prison, we know this has worked, right? We know in the financial sector this has worked, rather than being a kind of, um, a, a, a kind of it's been an equaliser, right? And it, you've seen the market respond to it. So I, I think that, that having something hanging over the company's Facebook will write off as the cost of doing business fines. Right, fines are important, but having a named manager who has the prospect of going to prison, right, if they are failing to address things that are brought to their attention repeatedly, we're not talking about you know one of or there's a problem or there's a piece of content. We're talking about repeated failures in respect of that duty of care once they've been notified about it. Then I think that people should face the prospect of going to prison. I don't see why, and this is why, for example, I think that that financial regulation in this space is good and that the, the Ofcom should be co-designating at least other regulators. Uh, I think financial regulation here and their expertise that, that that will bring across would be helpful. Um, I think that, that we ought to look to what we're we doing in the, in the country that works and we know that those penalties work. There are consequences that we have brought in for failure in financial institutions. These companies in some cases have wider reach than finer individual financial institutions and wider impact. So why are we not thinking of it in those terms? That, I think, is what we should do. Okay. I, I went specifically to Danny because he'd mentioned it earlier. I, I mean, we need to move on, but do you want to add anything to that? We don't have a specific kind of perspective on, on kind of on sentencing, but it strikes me there would be a lot of work to do to understand what the nature of the persistent repeat failure would be that would attract that kind of sentencing, because we're talking about a very wide range of behaviours when we think about the behaviours you're seeking to regulate, some of which probably shouldn't attract that kind of a penalty, and some of which perhaps should. So it's, I think you'd want to probably be quite a lot more specific for a seven-year jail Sentence, Le leads me quite on nicely to something there, actually, uh, Nancy. So, is there abusive content you're concerned may not be covered under the draft bill's definitions of illegal or harmful content? I think we are um, broadly happy with the way that the draft bill um, defines legal but harmful content. We'd like to see really close um, interrelationships made between the legislation here and hate crime and hate speech legislation in the UK, but also things like the um, uh, there is an interaction with the proposed ban on conversion therapy where promotion of conversion practices is going to be reserved for the online harms bill. So we need to kind of link all of those uh, pieces of legislation ac across one to the other so they form a kind of seamless package together that protect, um, protect our communities. But in broad terms, we think that linking across those pieces of legislation effectively and then into Equality Act protected characteristics in terms of, of priority content is a good approach. So does the link between, so you lead on, to, I'll come back to the other gentleman, so it leads on to this, so, so do you, does the link between online abuse and protected characteristics need to be specifically reflected in the government's proposed regulatory model? Yes, we would say yes for a range of reasons including that we know that there's quite a direct relationship between online and offline harm. Um, so for some of the reasons that we've that I pointed to earlier, so kind of outing, I mean not outing me, but outing many lesbians is itself leads to kind of serious consequences, homelessness, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But also we know that there is a link between online threats, offline um, physical harm, etc. And that's both in terms of one-to-one um, -one harassment, so somebody that is a cyber stalker that then becomes a stalker in real life but also the kind of volume behaviours we're pointing to, so a climate in which many, many people are homophobic or biphobic or transphobic online um, enables and emboldens people who may take discriminatory actions in real life. So we'd like to see, to see those kinds of protected characteristics reflected in terms of priority content. Okay, um, Matthew. 
Yeah, no, I fully agree with both those points. Um, yeah, we would very much like to see uh, the protected characteristics on the Equality Act referred to or listed explicitly in the bill. Um, I suppose the point I would add on top of that is to help with a sense of direction around some of these ambiguous terms that I referred to um, and to give a sense of direction for all of these consultations um, that are listed within the bill. I think at the moment it's, it's sort of all over the place and you get these um, the legalistic terms of you no know, relevant persons must be consulted. But I think once you start adding in the protected characteristics, you give it a sense of direction um, to groups that tend to be targeted more online. Um, and then the tying in with the hate crime laws and the offensive communications mm -hmm. reforms, I think are really important and it will help to bridge that gap between where the, um, the legal but harmful content ends and actually where it starts to move into a, an offense. Because at the moment it's, it's quite a network and quite a jumble to try and get through and I think that's part of the reason why you see quite low prosecution rates or referral rates to CPS in terms of hate crime. If, if, I, can, if I can on that specific, mm. I agree that the, the Law Commission's hate crime review is really important here and it would equalise some of the protections in related to aggravated offences, mm -hmm. right, which at the moment only relate to race and religion. Um, and similarly, that the communications offences, there's some really important things they pick up, and the government's indicated these will be in the bill. But for example, someone committing an offence who's um, outside of the UK, uh, outside of the UK, but habitually in the UK, in the, the Wiley case, the grime artist who was overseas when he posted his rant, but as I understand it, habitually in the UK, that would that would change the way in which uh, the offence was was recognised and addressed. And similarly, the Law Commission looks at comments boards. Um, which the online safety bill provides a specific exemption for newspaper comments boards and so it might be that we could see some um, joining up mm -hmm. if these if these uh, proposed offenses are now are now brought in through the bill okay so um, I, I move on but probably taking in a lot of what you've said there Danny in, in, in this following question as, as we said, the Law Commission has recently suggested changes to the law on online communications to help ensure that harmful online content doesn't escape criminal sanction. What are the key changes that you'd like to see to the law in this area and are they covered by the Commission's recommendations? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I, mm. I think um, aggravated versions of, of communications offences with stricter penalties, um, stirring up offences extended for legal clarity in relation to online behaviours, liability for actual knowledge of dissemination of unlawful materials. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff. I'd want to see some of the detail uh, about intended audiences. So, so if you post something on Gab and you know that you're posting to a mainly male audience and it's misogynist, anti-Semitic content, will that be caught or will it not? Because the audience that it may reach is going to be different from the audience that you've posted it to. So how will the, the law apply in terms of the audience that you're seeking to reach and will that be a consideration so some of the language i think will need will need probing um but generally speaking i think it's um these are these are good recommendations okay the same to you nancy I completely agree with everything danny's just said the thing that i would kind of caution against which is why i was uh, uh, kind of uh, wrinkling my forehead a bit is we know already that the the um less than half of of hate crimes and um, against LGBTQ people that are committed online, and I mean very serious forms of abuse, are, are reported. So I think it's really important for us to have as much, if not more, focus on um, online safety that falls below uh, the threshold of criminality. We know, we know that most people won't report even very, very serious harmful content online. So thinking about safety by design, thinking about algorithmic approaches to safety, thinking about these positive duties is certainly as important, if not more important, than making sure we have the appropriate criminal sanctions. Certainly for our community, we know the majority of people will not feel comfortable coming forward and reporting even very severe um, forms of hate speech against them. So I think there's just, for me, always this point about balancing, creating overall a safer environment and kind of proactive things that we can do through regulation and legislation that create that against sanctions for the minority of cases that will get brought for criminal content. How, how do you know 
how many people are not coming forward to the police because this is a real issue that we've got about how we collect that data oh. but also you know um how that data is then communicated to the relevant authorities and how is this addressed the best source we've got in the uk is gallup um the uh, specialist lgbt abuse charity did a great survey on um, online hate in our community and um, uh, it's around 40 something percent of lgbtq plus people report um, online hate speech and the rest of us don't and i say as mindfully i am myself been the target of hate speech online that i also haven't reported and so i just think it's and i suspect the figures will be even higher for for the communities that matthew represent in terms of people's propensity to report and come forward so so i mean there are things that we can do about making LGBTQ plus people or indeed disabled people, other marginalised groups feel more confident reporting to the police um, or, or reporting to kind of regulatory bodies. But we, we also have to focus on proactively making the space safe for the, yeah. for the majority or for the half that we know don't come forward. And, and, and that really concerns me because obviously when you are working with your LGBTQI plus community, you need to be looking at not just self-selected surveys. How do you reach more people? For example, I think your survey might have been done over a shorter period, a short period of time, only it reached so many people. How can we, you know, ensure that the data that you're getting is more robust? It's, so it's not ours. I wish it was ours. It's a great report it's by Gallup, um, and I think it's got around a thousand and some people in the sample. It's a pretty good sample for a for an LGBTQ plus survey. I do think the point you're making about lack, lack of data is really really important, mm -hmm. and I think thinking about um, how uh, as someone that used to work in social statistics, what national statistics we could use to gather good data. So is it British Crime Survey? Mm -hmm. Is it kind of uh, surveys like Health Survey for England that have a lot of mental health measures in them. I think the government investing in some good basic data in this space about um, online experiences of online abuse will be really, really valuable. And I'd seen that you'd worked in, 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 in research and data is your, is your expertise, which is why I think that getting the most robust data for Agreed. your community, you know, for the communities that you represent is really, really key to moving forward. Yeah. Matthew. I think on, just on the data point, um, we think levels are very high, but the data is just, it's very poor. Mm -hmm. um, even sort of data around hate crime is, is very difficult to, um, to get and it's not disaggregated under disability. So it is actually really difficult to understand what the picture is. Um, part of that is the official statistics aren't quite there yet. But on the other side, it's the perennial issue we have is actually trying to reach out to the community and as I said at the start, they're quite socially isolated, a lot of them, or secluded. So it's quite difficult to sort of understand or reach that person who might have experienced online harms that actually, actually hasn't reached out or hasn't reported it. All they might have done is given up on social media or deleted their account. Mm -hmm. So that's something we actually are looking at now and um, hopefully we'll have some data going forward. Um, we'll at least do our best to try and get a picture of what is going on. Um, and around... Um, uh, the, the wider picture, um, sorry, the, the first part, um, I've lost my track of thought. <laughs> Actually, no, I'll give up on that one, sorry. sorry. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. Um, so, Matt, I think you wanted to ask. Um, Can I just ask? Oh, yes, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Christina, you want to um, come in? Two things really concern me. Um, the first thing, um, Dan, you said the name manager should be prosecuted. You said the named manager. Uh, as seen, yeah, could, could be liable, yeah. What, what worries me about that is it's always going to be someone lower down the line that sacrificed, so I'm really worried about that. Maybe it should be the CEO should get it, you know. Just my own personal opinion. Um, the second thing that really worries me is um, if someone reports hmm. a crime, a hate crime, or whatever sort of crime at all, online, a crime, and nothing happens, and then it escalates. Are they going to be willing to report it again? You know, I'm not sure. So I have two major concerns there that I just wanted to vocalise with you to share with you. Wondered if you've got any thoughts on that. Just that the senior manager liability is established in, in the UK anyway, so we have that. I mean, you're right. I suppose there are concerns always about people being 
abused in some way or, or, or um, scapegoated rather. Um, so I understand that concern, but it is an established principle. Maybe on reporting, I think firstly just to say that you're right, people's experience of reporting, whether it's hate crime or whether it's abuse into a platform, really affects whether or not they then report again. Um, so you're pointing to something that's really important and it, it uh, really kind of, I think for me, for LGBTQ plus people, illustrates the need for whether it's police in the case of criminal uh, activity or it's um, online safety teams and standards teams within platforms, making sure that people are well trained, the point that Danny was making, um, to support people who may feel um, less safe coming forwards. I think there's a very specific piece around the interaction with reporting and platforms, so so kind of reporting to Facebook, reporting to Twitter, etc. and LGBTQ plus people, is a lot of these platforms have quite a bad track record of removing not harmful LGBTQ plus content. So there's um, there's can be quite poor trust between LGBTQ plus people and some of these platforms who have a track record of of treating our community differently, of removing co content that's not problematic um, just because it features LGBTQ plus people or talks about LGBTQ plus lives. Um, just quickly to say, um, there's a lot to be said around information and the accessibility of information. So I think there's a lot of trust that's being broken around people not understanding what the terms of service are, what the rules are, or even what the complaints and reporting processes are, which leaves, I think, a lot of people with disabilities quite some. Um, there's a sense of broken trust with mm -hmm. the platform of why are things being done in what seems to be a very inconsistent manner. So actually the online safety bill has that provision around accessible information and I think that will actually help to tackle some of those broken trusts um, that have happened over time and, and just give people that reassurance that these are the rules, um, there is an enforcement mechanism and this is the complaints process you can follow. Last but not least, We've got time um, yeah, a few minutes. Yep. Yeah. Um, this committee's 2019 report on the online experiences of disabled people found that hate speech and criminal abuse were under prosecuted. Has the situation improved any since then, Matthew? Um, I said uh, some of the stats I sort of said at the start show that um, the, the picture hasn't changed for disabled people and people with learning disabilities. Um, and I think that's going to continue through until we see some of these more um, systematic and structural changes around the law, around the bringing in of these sort of industry standard regulations for social media. Um, but there's also some good work that's going on at the moment. Um, so Dimensions are doing a wonderful campaign that is helping to train police around um, supporting people with learning disabilities who sadly often are seen um, as potentially in, uh, unreliable um, witnesses um, by the police or the CPS, which doesn't help with um, prosecuting criminal cases. So as I say, there are those sort of two, we do need to do some more training and better understanding about how people with those abilities can access criminal justice. And then also um, there's more systematic changes that could help bring those cases to trial. And then across the piece, uh, in your experience, do the police and prosecutors have the right information and resources to be able to effectively investigate and prosecute online abuse where needed? Police are under-resourced. I mean, it's always difficult, and that's why some of the Law Commission's hate crime um, law review is important, because it will give a bit more clarity on where and when they can take action, and similarly on, on the communications offences. Um, there is generally... Uh, a, there isn't as good a prosecution of anti-Semitic hate crime as we'd like to see. The numbers are relatively low. We put this in our submission to the to the Law Commission. Um, and I'd like to see also just use of, of, of other um, facilities. So, for example, community impact statements um, during prosecutions and the use of restorative justice, for example, which we think might play a part. So there, are, there, are, there is more that can be done to take some of the pressure off the police, but at the moment they are, I think, under-resourced and don't necessarily have always have the right skill set in terms of the training in, in relation to online harms. And that goes for the judiciary as well in terms of applying maybe particular uh, banning orders or whatever else. Um, so there's more to be done there too. 
Okay, I, I would echo everything Danny had just said. I mean, maybe just picking up the, the previous question that we, you were posing to Matthew. What we've seen over recent years is quite a significant rise in reported hate crime in our community. So primarily uh, not online, but including online hate crimes. And we do think that that is a combination of two things. One is kind of good news that more people are coming forward and reporting and feeling confident reporting to the police, which is a um, really, really important first step. The other really concerningly is that we think there is a, there is a real rise in hate crime. And we know from, from the research that does exist um, internationally that online hate speech against our community is rising, is proliferating, particularly anti-trans speech. So, so there's a kind of, there is a race to catch up um, online with a very kind of rapidly uh, evolving picture and a picture that then targets across groups. So Danny talked earlier about intersectionality and probably um, one thing just to make the committee aware of is that very prolific online abuse is often not against one community and people that become prolific abusers um, of one community very often are prolific abusers of multiple communities so I would really encourage um, the committee to kind of reflect on, on that fact mm -hmm. as well when thinking about how we create a, a safer online space. I think I sort of touched on the police in my previous answer but yeah I think they, they definitely are resource constraint um, as you know we can expect in every area um, so yeah I think that's the main issue but yeah as I said better training um, better awareness and yeah those, those structural issues I think will also help um, because of all the guidance that will come with those if they are implemented um, hopefully that will help the police the CPS and the judiciary actually um, bring more cases to justice and then beyond the legal and technical responses we've talked about, uh, are there steps you'd like to see the government taking to promote behaviour change online and help prevent abuse? Uh, and, you know, is there a role for the media literacy strategy? 100%, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think there, there's something, there's a, a phrase, cyberphrenesis, the building of moral knowledge over time. So that kind of approach, um, one that you know, we start at a, at, a, at a low level, I suppose, it's probably the wrong word, but a primary, a basic level, a primary school, and we build this all the way through, as we do with kind of safety awareness in IT, just that, that moral knowledge of understanding, you know, what you see online doesn't necessarily represent the truth, right? Um, I, I, one of my children told me that, oh, Facebook, they, um, there, there's a problem there, there it's going to be closed down because it's illegal because a lady said so in Parliament, right? <laughs> That's because what they'd heard from a friend who'd read something online and hadn't understood it, yeah. right? So it's it's how do we have those conversations about that online material and about the, um, you know, including fake news, as I was saying, uh, uh, misinformation. That's really, really important. So agree. I think I would really amplify the need to teach everybody, not just children, actually. We, we kind of think about it as if it's school children that are the problem. It's mostly not school children that are committing online hate, <laughs> I have to say that. Um, but, but just with the general public engaging around um, critical appraisal of evidence, so there is a cohort of people who are being taken in and radicalised by misinformation, and that is something... That, that we can do something about. It's less about debunking, um, kind of debunking and fact-checking doesn't work. It's more about building, um, building empathy with people and their perspective and helping them bring their own crit critical faculties to bear on the information they're being presented with. And then there's a cohort of people where it really is about de-radicalisation because it's not really about facts and people having believed something they read on the internet. It's about a kind of whole complicated set of factors. But I would really emphasize that it's, uh, the, the young uns are pretty good in this space. It's, it's the rest of us that probably need the educative work. Um, no, I think it's very, very important, both yeah, as for children and for adults. Uh, I think there's a role for the national disability strategy to mm. play, and there's an awareness campaign as part of this strategy. And I think that should be really taken up by the government and, and hopefully other parliamentarians as well, and, and so the whole civil space to try to change that narrative and, and tackle that stigma. Because I think, yeah, it's not just aimed at children, that is aimed at some wider society. And then the other part as well is around uh, media literacy work for people with learning disabilities and parents as well around um, empowering them, around educating them about staying safe online, 
and also for parents about how to engage with their child with a learning disability to, um, to stay safe online, but in a way that still promotes um, independence and learning. Because unfortunately, sometimes perhaps parents are a, a bit um, cautious. It actually leads to the person not perhaps using social media or using it in a very sort of incredibly sanitized way to it actually not having um, its intended purpose. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And thank you, panel. Thank you very much indeed. We've really appreciated you coming in today and contributing with your evidence. Um, and can I uh, say goodbye and invite our next panel to, um, to take your places? Welcome, and can I ask you to start by briefly introducing yourself? Um, shall I start with you, Ruth? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Ruth Smeath. I'm um, the Chief Executive of Index on Censorship, and for those parliamentarians sitting around the table, I used to be on that side, so it is very strange to be sitting on this side for the purposes of giving evidence. Yeah, I wondered whether I should declare an interest in being a great admirer of Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, hi, my name is Joe Mulhall. I'm head of research at Hope Not Hate. Uh, we're an organisation that monitors and disrupts far right extremism both online and offline. Cara. And my name's Cara Bacalis, and I'm a principal lecturer at Oxford Brookes University. And I have a sort of research expertise in um, hate speech and hate crime. Thank you. So um, I'll kick us off by. Um, asking, and I'm, I'm wondering who to direct this to, but I guess just indicate if you want to come in first, because um, we're, we're, we're not starting off with the gentle questions. Um, we'll, we'll get straight into it. So what differences do, in your um, expertise do you see already exist between the legal restrictions um, or other limits placed on abusive speech online rather than offline? Uh, yeah, I'll happily go first, especially I should also declare an interest because I'm on the board of Hope Not Hate and of the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust, but I have a slightly different approach this time. Um, I should also have said, Index on Censorship, um, we celebrate our 50th birthday this year and we were established to be a platform for dissidents um, behind the Iron Curtain to publish their work when, uh, if they published it in their own countries, they would have been killed for it. So we start from a position of free expression as a liberal democratic value, and that's why this is so important, um, and which is why I'm here today. One of the things I think that um, is really clear, and having just listened to your conversation with the previous panel, this is about how we do cultural change. And one of the things that this building has um, a bad history of is trying to regulate cultural change. So I think we've got to start from a position of what do we really want to achieve? And that is only going to be made harder if the rules that we have online are different to the rules that we have offline. Mm. Because what we're really talking about is the users, and both, uh, both the users and the targets of abuse. And I think there is a difference here that we can't lose. So there's a couple of... Um, issues that highlight this for me. Already, something is twice as likely to be deleted if it's in Urdu or, or, or Arabic than if it's in English. So with the current algorithms and how they work, we're already removing some people's speech. So there is an issue about transparency and how we're going to do it. There's also, we need really clear understanding of what we're trying to achieve and what the impact is. When I was sitting on that side of the table, I had no idea of how much we, um, we exported policy. Since this, the draft legislation that was published earlier this year, um, we use the phrase legal but harmful, something I am very, very nervous about the application of, and I think the definition is very poor and will end up in court. That definition was, was uniquely British, and now it's not. Now it's being used, uh, it's been added at uh, amendment stage to the Digital uh, Safety Act that's going through the European Union. There are consequences to that. It's also been cited by the Pakistani government as justification for how they're going to have their online um, regulation. Plus Bolsonaro, 
plus Moji, what you, what we may be trying to do in terms of the un, um, in terms of how we'll manage speech online, the unintended consequences of our language mm. and our legislation will be adopted by others. So our version of legal but harmful, our version of saying that potentially um, uh, staff that work for tech platforms should be arrested. When you, look, when you think of that, consider that through a British liberal uh, prism, that's one thing. When you think about it through a repressive regime, that is very, very different. I just think we need to be very careful about what we're exporting at the same time, which means there is an onus on you to make sure the language, language is so incredibly precise so that we're actually achieving what we need to achieve. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll come to you as well um, for your views on that. But the other aspect I would put... Um, and, and obviously I would give Ruth a right of reply on this as well, is that um, clearly the, one of the different aspects to online than offline is just the speed and the rapidity of amplification of something. So I would sort of challenge slightly the notion that everything should be the same online and offline and whether actually we should be applying a slightly different standard. Just I'd be interested in your views on that. Um, do you want to go? Mm -hmm. I'll go, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think I agree with you. I, I think we do need to think about the online world in a completely different way to the way we think about the offline world. I think that sort of mantra, what's a crime offline should be a crime online, and that we have the two have to mirror each other, was a really useful phrase to use when we first started thinking about how to regulate in the online world, because people weren't taking the online world seriously. They weren't thinking about how speech online could, could harm people just as much as offline speech. So I think that was a really useful mantra. But I think now that we're moving towards, you know, we've, we've, we've decided that actually we do need to do something about it, and the question is what do we do? I actually think we have to look at this a bit more carefully, and I, I don't think that we should consider the two the same. For a start, it doesn't really make sense to say what's a crime online should be a crime offline, because even in the offline world, we, we draw distinctions. We don't, you know... There, there are things that you can say in some places, but you can't say in others. We take context into account. Um, so um, which bit of the offline world are you talking about when you're saying that the two need to mirror each other? Even if we think about something like the public order offences, they do draw a distinction between the public and you know, what's happening in somebody's home. So, so we do draw that distinction in, in the offline world. So that, it doesn't make sense to me to say the two should mirror each other. I think also the points that you, you brought up about the, the sort of speed at which communications now can travel um, across the world, um, the, um, the permanency, these things are permanent. If somebody says something about you, they are there forever. Unless somebody is able to re remove them, they are there. They are searchable. Anybody who searches under your name will find these things about you. So I, I, those things don't exist in the offline world in any way near the same way. So again, I don't think we can treat the two the same and I, I think we have to take very seriously that this is a new world and we have to uh, you know we have to have quite targeted offences about for the online world that um, take into account the context and the nature of online, of online hate speech yeah just to follow on I completely agree actually and I'm difficult disagreeing with Ruth is on my board <laughs> but um, I'll forgive you at Hope Not Hate we monitor both online and, and offline hate groups and organised hate groups and individuals and there are enormous differences of course at its core the hatred is the same but the internet has revolutionised the way in which it's distributed and the way that it works and I think we have to take that into account I think there's a number of ways the online space is different uh, and one has been mentioned I mean Harmful content can be amplified in an online space in a way that is uh, not possible often in an offline space. That can be amplified by the platform itself or it can be done by thousands of other people simultaneously online. Um, the numbers of people you can reach instantaneously and simultaneously is, is remarkably different with huge lowering levels of cost, mobilisation, all the things that you would need to speak to 10,000 people on the streets versus the ease and ability to speak 10,000 people online. Um, the ease with which one can reach victims online, of course, is also uh, often far easier. You can sit in a bedroom in Australia and send anti-Semitic abuse to someone sat in London or transphobic abuse to someone sat in Canada. Um, the ease with which you can find and come across individuals who you want to target is much, much easier than it is, of course, offline. 
Um, the speed with which that harm spreads, I think, is also fundamentally important. If we look at the capital events in capital back in January, we look at the spread of kind of misinformation and anti-vaccine information and COVID uh, conspiracy theories or QAnon, as, as da uh, Danny mentioned earlier, the speed with which they spread across the Atlantic in the last two and a half years, moving from kind of tiny corners and niche corners of the internet to large global movements. Uh, again, these can happen offline, but the ease with which they happen online is remarkable. And also the social cost is, is much lower. Um, joining an organization, a hate group, etc., getting involved in street politics or standing on a street corner selling a far-right newspaper comes with a social cost that doesn't come from doing a lot of this activism online. And then the final thing I'll just say is there is an ability for this speech to have an amplified uh, sense of harm online in that you can create such toxic spaces that essentially you suppress the freedom of speech and rights of whole communities online in a way that is much, much harder to do offline. I think, uh, Tonya, you wanted to come back on and this will give you an opportunity, a right of reply if you, if you need it, Ruth. Yeah, sorry, Ruth. To, to the point I made as well. I'm not picking on you, Ruth, at all. <laughs> But it, I thought it was very interesting what you said about um, uh, unintended consequences of what we say being adopted by others. Mm -hmm. What about what we've not what we necessarily going to export, but what have we imported? Particularly around when I think about artificial intelligence, I think about Silicon Valley, I think about it being predominantly male and white. You know, is there a risk? Or we have been at risk, and they have we have seen this on the internet. What? Do you consider what we have imported and what has influenced us um, rather than what we are likely to export? Well, I think one of the biggest, through the um, through the, leg the proposed legislation, one of the biggest concerns is the lack of scrutiny. And what we're really doing, one of my concerns, is that we're outsourcing regulation, not from this, from this building, um, and what is appropriate language to people sitting in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And without the scrutiny, and I say this with the hugest of respect but there are very few people who sit in that chamber who, who have any understanding of how an algorithm works yeah. and how to read coding i definitely don't and um, so with in terms of our expertise to do this there is a genuine issue here and i have an um, and it's why i referenced the um the fact that something's twice as likely to be deleted if it's in Urdu or, or arabic than if it's in english mm -hmm. and that is because of people's pre-built because um, regardless of an algorithm still done by a human being it's still designed by a human being and they'll have inbuilt bias mm -hmm. so one of the examples we I do some work with the Syrian war archive um, and um, yeah. they collect data of for the first time in history social media data has been used as evidence for war crimes tribunals in Europe it's a really important thing when they have gone back they so they download it as they find it when they've gone back over a third of what they've downloaded has been deleted um, and it's been deleted because of the nature of the content. Some of it is illegal because it's evidence of crime, mm -hmm. so it's permanently deleted, which brings us to another issue I want to talk about at a later stage, which is a digital evidence locker. But also, it means that there's people's inbuilt bias. There is a really um, interesting example, in my opinion, of um, there was an anti-government demonstration in uh, Lebanon. Um, they were chanting anti-government um, uh, messaging on the demonstration, as you'd expect anti Hezbollah messaging, but the algorithm picked up the word Hezbollah, so the videos were deleted. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that from a British perspective, we would welcome anti Hezbollah messaging being retained online. The fact that it's, going, it's being deleted is not helpful for us either. Mm -hmm. So it's the unintended consequences, it's the lack of transparency of, and our knowledge and understanding of the algorithms and its access to these things. And honestly, it should be the people in this building that decide what language is or isn't relevant, what is or isn't deleted, and what we want people to see. I would very much welcome a national conversation about our online world and about how our online world operates. I completely agree, by the way, about context and nuance, but, and it will be different for what we expect to see on Facebook versus what we would expect to see on Mumsnet versus what we expect to see on um, Amazon reviews, for example. Where it, but this is that that level of nuance is not covered by this legislation. So, how we do nuance and context really difficult, but needs to be explored further. Well, there we go. I'm sure we're going to try and ask you all well, the answer to that. <laughs> 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 Matt, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah. How can we best balance the the need to make our online spaces safe with the need to you know not over regulate on freedom of speech? Um, 
Okay, so for... Um, sorry. Um, so for freedom of speech, it's a fundamental freedom, I think, and I, many of you, well, you will know of my own personal experiences as a target for online abuse. So I, of all people, will be have a level of cynicism and of interest about how we apply it. Um, but protecting free speech, protecting language, especially because words evolve, language evolves, we need to make sure that we're regulating in such a way that we're protecting the opportunity for you and I to debate from a different political perspective, from, to make sure that, our, um, that constituents can actually engage in the democratic process without undermining other communities and um, being targeted. So I think there's a couple of elements of this. One you touched on with your final question, which was about cultural change and what we needed to do. Absolutely, we need to give resilience to young people. And um, I think one of the nicest uh, things is the Scouts badge. Have you seen that Nominet, uh, Nominet and Scouts developed an online citizenship badge that you can earn? But honestly, we've just come through COVID. Everyone's upskilling and reskilling. There should be a digital citizenship element to every upskilling course that we're asking people to do. FE is key to this. We need to get the silver surfers involved, as we did when the original training was done. So getting the WI involved, getting out. Know, we need to give people the tools um, to know how to use social media in a constructive way. We also need to really, we need, I mean, my concern about the legislation is we talk a great deal about the platforms and not about the perpetrators. So you've got to balance the two out. And we've got to be really clear about language and what is and is not acceptable language. The other part of this, which is the protection for me, is the digital evidence locker. And I apologise, Chair, but I'm going to just engage on this slightly. The current legislation, I say this as someone who's been, who's been a target of abuse. If we're going to use AI to automatically delete content, I wouldn't know when I am at my most vulnerable. The most recent person to be arrested for harassing me was in April this year. My abuse hasn't stopped since I left this building. On that basis... I would been, and they lived three miles from my house, I'd have been very, very vulnerable and they wouldn't have been arrested. What we need is a digital evidence locker, but we need a legal framework for it because there one doesn't exist so that the platforms can store illegal material because currently they can't legally store illegal material so that the security services can go and look at it, so that journalists can see how much is being deleted, so civic society can see if this legislation is being applied appropriately. And most important from your perspective, in terms of the question, is we can see how language is evolving and what language is being deleted and why it's being deleted. And you can do an academic analysis of that. Because we, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about prevent recently. Mm. Whist um, uh, dog whistle politics is really unfortunate language evolves, different words will become trigger words, and we will miss them if words are being deleted or if some certain content is being deleted. We need to know what's happening. In order to do that, we need the evidence base. And that will be a digital evidence locker, which also means the security services could still make prosecutions and we could actually still prosecute the perpetrators of, the, of these crimes. I can sense agreement breaking out across the um, panel. I don't know, um, did you want to come in there, Joe? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I agree on, on some of it. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I don't mean complete agreement. No, no, I just yeah, think yeah. Cora was nodding at the um, evidence locker. Yeah, I mean, look, the free speech point is absolutely central. I think uh, understandably everyone is incredibly nervous about getting this wrong and, and unduly suppressing freedom of speech. I think that's why, just to speak to what Danny was saying earlier, I think why the emphasis, emphasis being treated on design problems and platforms rather than individual content and users as, is going to be a better and safer way. When it comes to the free speech debate, I think it's worth realising, and the legal but harmful, element of this. The content we're talking about is often very, very extreme. Whether or not you know, Holocaust denial would fit within this sort of framework, so would misogynistic abuse and you know, COVID misinformation, etc. I think the big problem around when we have this debate around free speech is we take such a narrow discussion around it, which is what content will be removed. And that takes such a narrow view of what these online spaces already look like and the amount of suppression of free speech was, which is currently happening on them. I think um, it's not just about what will be removed, but it's about what is already missing. Uh, and I think if done properly and we address legal but harmful properly, we can actually vastly expand the amount of free speech in online platforms. Mm -hmm. We have a wide range of people whose freedom of speech is already suppressed. 
uh, women, you know, LGBT people, as we heard earlier, um, people of colour. You, you can name it, you can go on. We have such toxic online spaces that there are whole areas of the internet where people do not feel comfortable to raise their voice and, and cannot be heard or be shouted down if they did. And as a result, by protecting that sort of speech in some way, we are allowing the amplification of it and we're also, in the long term, stopping the ability for whole communities to have a voice. So if done well, I think, this is actually about, it's not going to suppress free speech by removing this sort of hateful content. It's going to massively and dramatically increase the amount of people whose voices are heard. And the danger is if we continue with this very narrow debate which places free speech against regulation, uh, we'll end up continuing with these toxic online spaces where whole parts of community, and especially if we see social media as kind of a, a central space for public debate, which I think nowadays it's so ubiquitous that it is, we have to look at the content that's missing as well as the content which is going to be removed if this legislation goes forward. Mm. You got anything to add to that? Um, just, Sorry, to, just, yeah, just to say that it's, um, they, uh, you know, uh, Joe and Ruth both came up with really good ideas, and I think. It, we are going to have to accept that this, there's no easy solution here. We're not going to come up with a law that is going to make everything okay, that's going to protect victims and it's going to protect free speech. It's not going to happen. We need a raft of measures in place. So there is you know, room for the criminal law, but there is also room for regulation. And broadly speaking, I'm in favour of the online safety bill. However, I do share Reed's concerns about the detail of how that's actually going to operate. Um, but I, I'm not going to talk about education and so on because you've already talked about it, but, but I think we are going to have to see this as, a, as several things will need to be in place and there's, there's no sort of magic key here that will make everything okay. And then the biggie about ID and verification uh, and how, how that balances into holding people to account, what's your perspective on that? Mm. Um, I, um, I think it's probably surprisingly given my previous employment, but I'm opposed to online anonymity um, for several reasons. First of all, um, people use anonymous accounts for different reasons. And I think that you know, there is a compromise, as Danny outlined, there is a compromise probably here to be found. But my dissidents use social media platforms to contact me. Um, they do it anonymously. It's the only safe way that they can contact me, given the countries that they live in, whether you know, um, we helped um, people in Myanmar, in Belarus, in Afghanistan. There are limited ways, in Hong Kong at the moment, there are limited ways of communicating. So um, anonymous accounts are key. I was talking to someone in Hong Kong this morning on Twitter. Like This is um, uh, via anonymous accounts. So I think that's we've got to be really careful, again, about the unintended consequences. There's also, as was touched on by the previous panel, if you're a target, if you've been a target, if you're experiencing domestic violence, using an anonymous account to reach out for services might be the only safe way for you to do so. If you are finding your sexuality, using an anonymous account might be the only way of you finding yourself, especially if you live in an area that doesn't have a significant um, um, uh, LGBTQ community. So. I just think that we've got to be really careful about what we're doing and why. Also, although um, the majority of my abuse, and I got a lot, the majority of my abuse, people were pretty proud to be using their own names. I mean, I don't think my abuse would stop. The reason why we were able to prosecute some is because we knew who they were. So I'm, I don't think that helps. What I do think helps is prosecution is making sure that you know, how you apply cultural change is making sure that people are actually prosecuted. And if I just beg your indulgence briefly, Chair, I had two significant death threats arrive from during the 2019 general election, one of which was hand-delivered to my office. So we got CCTV, fingerprints. I mean, they weren't very bright, so we got a picture of them. They were arrested and through the criminal justice system within weeks. A second, I mean, I've got loads of abuse, but the second significant one, um, they are due to go to, uh, go to court this month, two years after, and that was all on social media. We knew exactly who it was, they were a constituent, yeah. and yet it's two years, and it's because of the resourcing associated with this. So, you know, anonymity would sound like it's a really easy way to deal with the abuse. But honestly, unless we're using the criminal justice system to prosecute, unless we're making examples of what is or is not acceptable, then all of this just becomes irrelevant anyway. This one's easy, and I agree, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so yeah, I mean, uh, I think anonymity is a fundamental, uh, and um, I get extremely nervous about any attempts to tamper with it or, or uh, reduce it in any way for a number of reasons. I will say from the outset that, that I think there's most sensible uh, ideas so far have come from Danny Stone and the CST in terms of a way that might be to be able to get through this. But, um, you know, there's lots of reasons why it's so important that we mentioned LGBT people, but victims of domestic abuse, but also at Hope Not Hate, it's something we, we, we use a huge amount in terms of our research into far-right terror organisations, etc., to try and keep ourselves safe and the information that we, we find safe. I think there's two things here. One is, would actually removing anonymity work? In one sense, it would possibly reduce the issue here, but there is a whole host of other ways. A huge amount of the most toxic abuse that we come across is obviously by named accounts. And I think it's actually worth differentiating between what is an anonymous account. In some sense, if someone creates an account, and instantaneously sends a footballer abuse or an MP abuse and then disappears straight away, it's almost impossible to find that person if they're, if they're doing it, if they're clever online. But there are ways you can reduce the impact of that, for example, by encouraging what you call stable accounts, which are you have to have an account for a certain period of time before you can write to someone with a blue tick or you can write to an MP, etc. As a result, an individual has to be online over a prolonged period of time before they essentially accrue benefits in the social media space. And that way you can significantly reduce that instantaneously creation of account and disappearing. And why I think this is important is because stable accounts are much easier to attract or find or track down when they are, even when they're anonymous. We spend a huge amount of time at Hope Not Hate. Our job is finding people engaging in hate speech who are anonymous and exposing them. And there's cases like uh, the terrorist Luke Hunter, which took us many weeks to find, but we did manage to track down through various anonymous accounts who the person was. And so I agree with Ruth that one of the things here is, is not necessarily just that it's uh, anonymity, but there is not the resources to find it. It takes us a long period of time to find these people. And one of the issues is, of course, law enforcement, the resources required to do this. If you look at the online hate crime hub, they do remarkable work, but I think it's about three people. right? And so when it comes down to a huge amount of the problems is when you report anonymous abuse online, there are ways in some cases to find them, but it may take time and resources, time and resources that the current online... Uh, policing hub does not have and so we notice the difference for example when we report terror content or we find terrorist content invariably quite often those people are found and prosecuted because they are prioritized resources are put towards them they are tracked down and prosecuted so for me I think if there was resources to actually look into these anonymous accounts properly there would be much less of a bar in terms of reaching that level of prosecution and I think there is just other things as I say especially around encouraging stable increasing friction in the system that makes it harder for individuals to create complete anonymous accounts and disappear and of course stopping the social media companies from allowing the promotion of harmful and divisive content through algorithmic amplification and those sorts of things. I think there's other steps we can take without getting anywhere near touching anonymity which I think is just too important uh, to go near. I agree. Um, the only thing I would add is um, that I think that um, by focusing so much on anonymity and trying to, you know, you know, make people say who they are online, um, it may mean that we're slightly, um, we might be misconstruing or misunderstanding what the real problem is here. It's not necessarily the individual perpetrator that we want to hold to account. Of course, there will be some instances when we do, but actually, a lot of the problem with the hate that's occurring online is not that there's an individual person who said one thing that's been really hurtful. It's a kind of, you know, general um, drip, drip, drip effect of all these different comments that added together um, create a um, negative atmosphere. And so that's why anonymity, not anonymity, is really not the important thing here. We need to focus on how do we give platforms or how do we force them to actually remove those comments that we think are adding to this negative atmosphere. So is there anything I would add? Um, I was going to say, um, I think, unless, have you got a follow-up on that? Yeah, yeah, just to, uh, so a quick one. Because the, uh, you articulated very well the need for legitimate anonymity, but then in terms of this, this two, A, holding people to account, but B, what's to prevent someone banging another account up, from, you know, who's been banned from a platform? Where, what measures do you see as, as, how do you control that? I wouldn't want to, but um, I think that there are some really interesting proposals out there, which is... Um, uh, potentially uh, the amount of information that the social media companies have on all of us is quite significant they could put holds on how um, and put, and suspend people full stop you have to you know what data you have to give them 
Um, I like the idea of one stage verification potentially, but um, the, um, and what that could look like, a mobile phone number, for example, because if it's one of my dissidents, they could then delete their mobile phone number if they needed to. I mean, so there are ways and means of doing it. I also am very nervous because of the people that I work with, and I think all of us work with in terms of safeguarding, um, a data breach for them would kill them. You know, so that would, you know, and I'm, and I'm not over-egging that. They would be very, very, very vulnerable. So I think we've got to be really careful about how much data we're demanding that um, the companies actually have that could make others vulnerable. Um, but you could, but there are ways and means that you, whether it's IP addresses, whether you know, there are ways and means of the, the technology that you could apply to um, to do it. There's also, as Joe just outlined, um, you've that, that uh, an account would have to be live for a matter of weeks before they could engage. That's quite an interesting way to set up a, um, and to 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 engage in that way because then you're protecting both ends. One of the other proposals about. Um, whether you choose to see non-verified accounts or not. I think one of the things that was very noticeable for me when I arrived in 2015 and I did my own social media, there were hardly any protections in place at that point. By the time I left this place, the protections were huge. I now only know when I am in the middle of an online Twitter storm when I see someone has defended me because that's broken through into my comments. I've got, and I thought, oh, I wonder why they'd be nice about me. And I really wish I hadn't gone to look. So I think there's a balance here about, what protect, about making sure people know what protections they can use now. And slightly different for the 2019 intake, but if you were in Parliament before then, and you did your, um, you have no, everyone handed it over to their staff, so they had no idea of the protections that now exist because we just we ran away from it because it got really horrible and i think that the world's changed but we had we, um, politicians didn't keep up with the changes that happened our staff did the only thing i'd briefly add on that is of course i think we should give individuals more control over their social media that they see we have to try and do it in a way to make sure we don't further marginalise voices that are already extraordinarily marginalised. So when we talk about undocumented migrants or sex workers or young LGBT people, people that are often extremely marginalised in public discourse, if we create a system, for example, where MPs only can only ever see completely verified accounts, then they will never hear those voices. And so I agree. I don't, know, I don't have the exact solution for that, but we just it's one thing to keep in mind is if we go too far down that road, we can further marginalise those voices. In terms of counts that come back, I, there's a few things. I mean, we send lists endlessly to the tech companies saying these people have been banned, we've found them, they're still on the platform. Now, we're a small NGO. Um, they can be doing that themselves if they wanted to put in the time and resources to look into accounts that were causing harm, uh, but they don't. So uh, I think I would throw a lot of the owners back on the platforms. They also have such vast amounts of data on people that they can target advertising to within an inch of our lives. They can work out mm. a whole host of things. It's a huge amount of this is about the will of the tech platforms just not being there. Um, so yeah, and, and then also really the issue is not the, the accounts coming back. The real issue is, is the, whether or not the accounts are causing harm. And so if you reduce the way that those accounts can cause harm, it's less important whether or not the person's been banned and came back if they come back and all they're doing is videos about cats. So I think it's about making sure that if we reduce the harm, we reduce the impact of returning accounts. Yeah. I was going to go to Tonya next, um, who, I, who I think is probably going to direct some questions to you, Cara. So if you've got something to add, you know, do. Okay, great. Uh, right, so um, Cara... What are your views on the Law Commission's proposed changes to the criminal law on online communications and the kind of harmful content which could face criminal sanctions? And, I, and you particularly have argued that changes to the law on online abuse are needed to help to ensure groups frequently targeted online feel safe. So do you feel the Commission's recommendations go far enough to help achieve this? Because I know you've done a lot of uh, work on safe spaces online for women. I think probably not overall. I do think, it, on the positive side, I think the, uh, the new offence they want to create, um, uh, threatening communications, that, that I think is a, is a good offence and I think that will go some way towards um, mitigating some of the, the, the problems people are having at the moment and getting a prosecution, um, a, a conviction. Um, but I don't particularly like, to be honest, I don't like their new offence uh, on, based on um, serious psychological harm. I don't think, I have a problem with it on two levels that may seem contradictory to, to begin with, but they're not really. Um, the scope of them, I think, potentially means that actually they'll rarely be used. 
when you're talking about the fact that you've got to show that somebody um, intended to cause serious psychological harm and that you've persuaded a jury that that was likely to happen, um, I'm not, and that this is one off communication, because if it's a pattern of behaviour, then we're talking about harassment offence. This is a one off. So I'm not sure how many offences would come within that. So that's much narrower than the current uh, um, Militia Communications Act and Communications Act offences. So, so I think actually it probably will give less um, protection to victims. Now that may be a good thing from a freedom of expression point of view. I didn't like the old. I don't like the Militia Communications Act. The Communications Act. I think they are. I think there are serious concerns from a freedom of expression point of view. But that's why I would advocate for a much more targeted approach here. And, I, and I've argued that we should have tailored online hate speech offences where you're specifically dealing with hate speech as opposed to, at the moment, uh, it's sort of anything indecent or grossly offensive or in, under the new, new offence it will be psychological harm. I, I don't think that's the, that's the right approach. I don't, I'm not even sure that psychological harm is the thing that we're trying to guard against here. And is it something that can be measured? Well, I'm actually writing a paper at the moment with somebody who's a cyber psychologist, um, and we're, we're sort of at the beginning stages of it, but um, part of the problem is, is that you, you may or may not be able to, to, to measure it, but quite often it's, it's a person's initial psychological <coughs> state that can determine whether or not they reach and go over that threshold. So then it, it depends on a particular individual, but the criminal, but the way that the offence is... is, is um, defined, you don't necessarily need a, a, an actual victim, it's just a sort of, this is likely to happen. Mm. So I, I'm, so, but I'm not really sure that that is the harm that we're trying to guard against here. I know that, you know, when we, when we listen to victim group, that this is the sort of harms that they, that they, that they tell us are happening. But when you look at the evidence that the Law Commission used, um, the evidence they were using was really based on kind of harassment offences, where there's a pattern of behaviour, not a kind of one-off <laughs> comment. And and I think part of the problem is we don't, we have never done a proper, sort of um, comprehensive study of what is this speech that people are being impacted by. Is it hate crime? Is it hate speech? Is it nothing to do with hate? Is it is it sort of personal abuse? Um, so we, we don't really understand what problem it is that we're trying to tackle. Um, and and because we don't know that, we aren't in the position to create proper targeted offences that 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 would. A, protect victims, but also if they're targeted enough, that would also satisfy freedom of expression concerns. The problem with, with the current offences and with the new offences, they're too vague, they're too broad, and immediately that causes problems from a freedom of expression point of view. Whereas if you could be much more targeted, um, that, that balance between the two is much more easily satisfied. When will you finish your piece of work? <laughs> <laughs> not, not for a few months, I don't think. But. I'm certainly happy to. I've I'm also st just started work uh, with a group who we've managed to get some, mon some money from the Fundamental Rights Agency, so it's EU funding, um, to actually undertake a kind of analysis of, um, we're going to do a sort of scraping of um, various comments from um, social media websites, but actually not from the UK, actually from Europe, to do this kind of categorisation to try to work out what's going on. So I have to share that as well, but that's still quite a long way in the future. Uh, how, do you, how, would, how do you expect these, you know, proposed new offences, if they were adopted, how would they affect social media platforms and their response to online abuse? It, it, I suppose it would in terms of the online safety bill when it says illegal content, you've got to make sure you get rid of illegal content. It will, of course, form that part of their duty of care, that code of conduct that, that relates to, le to legal content. They will have to follow whatever the law says, whatever the new proposals are. Um, uh, don't, don't, does that answer your question or I'm not sure? Yeah, no, no, yeah, I think okay. so. I think it does, yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if anybody else has got anything to add to, to what I was focusing. I, I think the Malicious Communications Act, I mean, all of this is irrelevant if we aren't policing it and we yeah. haven't put resources for policing. And when I got, you know, I thought, when I got my first death threat, when I got my first death threat in 2014, um, the police at that point didn't have access even to Facebook. It was banned as an HR issue because it, you know, it was time wasting for them. They might waste their time yes. looking at Facebook. So we had to download and print off everything <coughs> for my first set of, of abuse. Although they can now see it, I don't really think they've got the resources available to help them prosecute. And so 
whether the legislation is amended or not, um, it's so incredibly important that people that the criminal justice system can do its work, and to do that, we need they need resources. And I think that that's a record, that is part of this conversation. This is the first time in all of the, the, the stuff that that element of it has been discussed. Great, thanks. Thank you, Jen. Luta pays. Yeah. Just, just very briefly, I mean, obviously, generally, I very much defer to <laughs> the expertise. I think there's a, a few, in terms of the law, the recommendations, I think there's a general point, which is they certainly start to push the bill towards focusing on content and users and away from systems. And, and I think that's where we, we might see overreach. And so that's something. There is also a general point here around so much of this is, is a global phenomenon. This is not about just what's happening on our streets and stuff. And in our communities or even in the UK, the, the hate can come from anywhere in the world, which obviously makes it very difficult when it comes to prosecution or taking a legal route around this, again, which is why the emphasis needs to be on the platforms rather than necessarily just the content and the users. But broadly speaking, clearly, there has to be some sort of update. I mean, I hope not hate. When we look at far-right individuals that are prosecuted for things they're doing online, they're generally either under terrorism legislation, public order offences or communications act, and they're often prosecuted under legislation which happened before I was born let alone before, you know, when the internet, etc. So I think there is clearly some holes when it, we talk about that thing at the very beginning, online versus offline, there has to be some updates. And I think the positive elements of the recommendations are this shift from these kind of broad notions of grossly offensive towards looking specifically at harm. How we define those things I think is going to be important, but um, moving towards more context-specific analysis, I think, uh, of this thing is going to be a really useful way forward. Joel, some, something you just said then, you know, the question I asked to uh, Danny Stone earlier about the penalties companies should face for breaches of duty of care, you went on to say about, um, you know, it, it should be perhaps with, with somebody in charge of that at the social media platform. Would, would you agree with what he, what he was saying there? That if, if, it's, look, if it's global, then surely somebody at Facebook in charge of X should be... Yeah, no, absolutely. I do agree with Danny that I think we need uh, kind of direct penalties to executives at these platforms. Um, I think you can argue that uh, this is why I think the duty of care thing is a useful argument in that we have a duty of care to users in the United Kingdom and if the platforms are breaking and consecutively breaking that duty to people in Britain then there should be a legal consequence for the people at the platform. Um, that means, for example, that someone can sit in Australia and send racist abuse or do engage in harmful behaviour constantly uh, that is affecting people in the United Kingdom, then the platform still should be liable for that and should be facing consequences for their failure to protect people in Britain from that harmful behaviour. I'm really nervous though that the idea that we would prosecute not the people who are um, undertaking the abuse, but the people who, I, uh, who work for the platforms. I think that, you know, the, I am genuinely, mm -hmm. the idea that the perpetrator gets away with whatever they want to do and there's no criminal liability and they don't go to prison and they, they don't get fined, but the platform, which is a neutral entity, unless we can prove and demonstrate that it's their algorithms and it's their AI or it's structurally set up to facilitate people threatening to kill me, I am genuinely nervous that we are focusing our efforts on the wrong element of this. Um, that we're not, you know, it's the f it, we're ignoring the people who are actually breaking the law. It, but it, it wouldn't, would you say it's about challenging both though? The, obviously, the platforms have a duty to take on the perpetrators and deal with them, and if they fail to do so, then it's the platform that ultimately has that responsibility. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone's arguing for either or. I think the argument's mm. very much both. I think there is an issue of we should be we should be tracking down the individuals and users and content that is breaking the law. But this legislation would obviously go beyond illegal content. If it, I think if it was to be effective, it would need to go beyond illegal content. But it is also algorithms, it is also AI. Part of the issue that this content causes so much harm is because it is amplified by the nature of these platforms through algorithmic recommendation, etc. You know, I would sleep better at night if the far right still had to radicalise people on a one-to-one -one basis in the pub rather than people opening their phone and the, the information is handed to them and sent to them. Right, and so these are the things where we go after the platforms for. But absolutely, if people are engaging in sending death threats to MPs, that's a legal issue, and we should be going after them and the pieces of content as well. So I don't think anyone's arguing either or. No, it's just this legislation puts more onus on the platforms than it does on the perpetrators, and I think there's the the balance of that is skewed in this legislation. 
they're, they're not neutral entities, the platform, are they? You know, they are... I don't think Mark Zuckerberg... Well, I, I, I don't think he cares about me, but I don't think he's interested one way or the other about whether I'm... I don't think he... I don't think he established his platform to facilitate people, to give people a pathway to threaten me or you or anybody else. I think that... And that may be incredibly naive, but I just don't think that that's why it was set up. I think that it's, I think we've got to be really... Um, We've just got to be, I think we've got to step back. It's a very emotive area, especially mm. because all of us have experienced, and, and include, especially the groups that you heard from earlier, all of us have experienced horrendous things on social media. But we also, you know, 10% of what I received came also via telephones and via letters. And if we'd been members of parliament 30 years ago, it would have been green, green ink letters we would never have threatened to ban green ink, right? So I just think we need to be really careful about how we're doing this and who we're blaming for it. And I don't want, um, from both as someone who sat on your side, I don't want it taken away from the perpetrators. And also, I don't want us to forget about the education and cultural element that goes alongside this and just give it to... Which we're coming to. I'm conscious of time. All right, okay. Um, so I was going to bring in Mark, because I know... Um, He's got some questions he wants to put. Yeah, thanks. Uh, on, <coughs> on the subject of the, the content that's not illegal and looking at the government's draft online harms bill with the requirement of platforms to enforce their own rules, does that strike enough of a balance between tackling the abuse of content and avoiding unnecessary state intervention? Sorry, do you want to go? Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is a really difficult one because when I first read that, I was horrified and I thought, I can't believe they're doing this. This is, you know, how can you have these platforms to have control over harmful but, but, but legal content? But I've thought about it a little bit and I guess there are two things that are, are, are making me change my mind. Um, one is that the platforms are already doing this. The platforms already are making a decision about what, what goes on or what doesn't go on. If you look at community standards, I know, I appreciate they're not properly um, uh, implemented, but if you look at the community standards and you look at their uh, description of hate speech, for example, it's far, far wider than what the law describes as hate speech. So, so that, that illegal content is already, is already um, being taken away. And I guess then you've got, you've got to think, who do I trust more? Do I trust... Facebook more to decide what I get to see, or do I trust the government? It's difficult, but you know I am veering towards a kind of independent, you know, regulator where you know you have lots of different people involved and so on. Um, I think is preferable to Facebook. The other thing that I think is also important is when we're thinking about this balance between uh, freedom of expression and protection of the victims. Um, when we look at this from a human rights perspective. The, the penalty imposed on somebody is absolutely crucial in determining, determining whether or not you've achieved that balance. And actually having this, this category of harmful but, but, but legal content um, may well mean that we are keeping that balance much better. Because what's the alternative? The alternative is that we increase what we consider to be illegal content. You know, that's, that's the alternative. If we think that there's stuff that's going out there that we don't want to be out there, but we, can, we are limited to what's, um, what the law says, well, we'll just change the law and just make the law really broad and come out with broad offences that can cover all sorts of material. So, so, so that's why, whereas at least this way, if we, you know, you know it's going to be the Secretary of State that lays out what, what constitutes harmful, and um, if we can see the detail of exactly how that's going to, those decisions are going to be made and how people can feed into that, it, it's making me less um, concerned. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, first thing I'd say is I, I do think actually on the duty of care thing around freedom of speech, the best way to remain or to, to stop overreach will be to concentrate on platforms and the duty of care rather than content. So I think there's a paradox in arguing it the other way around. I do absolutely agree around the legal but harmful thing, and I think there's a few things to say. One is I don't think this is a new phenomenon, legal but harmful. People are talking about it often in a sense like it's this kind of new huge threat to freedom of speech. Um, it's already in numerous pieces of legislation. The Communications Act from 2003 places a duty of care on Ofcom to deal with legal but harmful content on broadcast. So I think there is a whole host of places, as you mentioned earlier, a whole host of ways in which speech that is legal, um, we curtail it certain places or being from in certain places due to the harm it can cause. And so I think it's absolutely possible to, to, to 
say that we should be expanding that into the same way on social media in the same way that we do for under the existing communications legislation. Okay, I don't agree. Um, <laughs> but um, um, I understand where the principle and the duty of care element comes from. Um, I think that legal but harmful as a definition is extremely dangerous, especially because there isn't a proper definition for what legal but harmful could be. And with a level of political interference, and obviously the Secretary of State will operate in a non-political way always, um, but with them getting to define what is legal but harmful, that means it can be politically manipulated. And I find that very, very disconcerting. And I think it will also end up in court because of that. And when we, you know, it touches also again on the psychological harm conversation, I would suggest that people who have experienced a level of uh, targeting have ended up much more resilient than others, unfortunately. And so what would be psychologically damaging for me at this point, I have a higher threshold because of what I've seen than other people may. And I think that if that's the definition, really, really difficult. It also brings on, uh, which we haven't touched on, which is the exemption clauses and politicians and political speech being exempt and also journalist speech being exempt. We have never been able to define what a journalist is in the UK for very good reason. And that is even more complicated on an online platform because of citizen blogging and citizen journalism. And so, for example, you know, if, someone, um, ha if someone has videoed something awful and they, that then goes viral, but they've witnessed something, they almost become a journalist because mm. of what they've put up and what's gone viral, and, you know, as, as was the case with George Floyd's murder. So I think we've got to be really careful about what we're doing. And, I, and in terms of the political um, definitions, I'd say this, with, you know, I am a former elected official. I may or may not stand for office again. I put, I'm the chief executive of an organisation that publishes a quarterly magazine. I could make a case that I should be exempt on many different grounds, except I'm also just a normal human being. I hate to step on, hope not hates toes, so forgive me, Joe. but Tommy Robinson has stood for election. Lawrence Fox stood for election. Where do they, do, are they then exempt for everything that they've said, even when they've been, even if they or others have incited Violence? Would you then stand for election and pay the deposit for a general election in order to say whatever you want with complete protection from the law? We know that people stand for election, um, at a general election, and pay 500 quid in order to get the free post to have menus delivered. It is not beyond the realms that that would go further in other examples. And I just think we've got to be really, really careful with definitions as key within all of this. Just on that, yeah, I mean. On the first bit, I would say that the, the, the duty would be on Ofcom to, to come up with what is harmful and He's uh, going offensive. to be their chair, Joe. I know, but, it's, <laughs> but that's exactly... Ofcom is currently the ones that are coming up with what is offensive and harmful for broadcast, and so the, the onus would be on a sensibly <coughs> independent body. Uh, I would just like to completely reiterate the two sections of the legislation where there is uh, democratic important speech and journalistic speech is extremely problematic. Uh, for exactly the reasons that Ruth has said, a huge amount of the numbers or individuals we monitor now class themselves as citizen journalists. And of course, uh, we've, we're one, of, one of the things we're most concerned about in the legislation is we've spent many years trying to convince tech platforms to deplatform incredibly dangerous and toxic individuals. Um, you know, Nick Griffin, for example, the former leader of the British National Party, would his speech be classed as democratically important if he stands in an election? Is Tommy Robinson a journalist? All of these questions. And so I think there's a huge amount more kind of maybe it's one for the philosophers, but to come up with some serious definitions around those two terms, because at present, those are uh, kind of, they feel like they've been somewhat thrown in, and uh, the danger is they're going to hugely undermine the bill. I'm conscious of time. Um, are okay, you happy? Sure yeah. Questions. So I'm going to go to Christine, last but not least, and hopefully going to end <coughs> on a positive note. Well, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, I think you're going to say yes to, to this question, right, which is should the government be doing more to try and drive cultural and behavioural change amongst social media users to reduce online abuse alongside possible legal and regulatory changes? So I think you're going to say yes to that. So I'd like to, to, to know what, what you think that would look like in practice, uh, particularly in education in schools and also efforts to reach adults. Um, so one of the... Um, 
Google do an amazing um, education program where they come into schools, they take over the school for the day, and then they work, and then they now teach other people on how to teach. And I think one of the reasons why they're so good at it, and um, they came to um, a school in um, Kidsgrove, one of the reasons why they're so good at it is because they know their users really well, right? And they also know that they're very aware of the problem. So, as was suggested earlier, working with the platforms to develop programs. Uh, chair, if you're talking about polluter pays, that's definitely one of the things that they could and should be paying for. But I also think that this is wider than just ch children. I mean, the, the, the original um, um, drivers behind this piece of legislation was about young people and safety and security, where actually all of us live a far too big chunk of our lives online now. So it's in its broadest sense. So how do we educate and empower people at every level, which is why I think, as I said earlier, you know, getting the WI involved and getting um, community groups involved. And for, as we did when the internet first arrived, so we got every level of community engagement to educate people so that they knew how to use the internet and how to use computers. I think we've got to go through that process all over again. Um, some of it could be statutory, and I do think that um, as we're upskilling the country, we are going to do things, you know, we're currently sitting through COP, I think there will be an education programme that comes out of COP that will align with, uh, that touches all ages on how they can be better green citizens. There is nothing to stop us doing digital citizenship at the same time. And if you want to access some of the, what the government could do, if, if you want to access some of these sites, you could have to do an online training module before you did. That could be a really easy way to do it too. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a huge amount to add. I mean, beyond, I, mean, I, I always remember, I definitely think it, we, we talk a huge amount of time about we need things in primary schools, and absolutely we do. But I remember I used to be a lecturer at university, and a student gave me an essay which was full of Holocaust denial. And when I challenged him on it, he was utterly appalled, and he couldn't believe it. And, um, and it was because he, his ability to differentiate sources that he'd found online versus ones that he'd found in the library wasn't there. And this was a guy at a, a red brick university. So... Um, there is a thing that has to be about going education, and I'm sure when we think about COVID misinformation and people engaging in the conspiracy scene, this is people of all genders, all ages, all backgrounds. Uh, this education is a society-wide educational program which is required. We should absolutely start in primary schools, but we should also be starting with my aunt. You know, I mean, so um, uh, that's why we put it across there. And the, and the only thing I'd say on top of that is uh, people are engaging in abusive behaviour online, partly because of the nature of those online spaces, but people engaged in online hate because they hate people. And actually we have to root our online education in our much wider programs of attempting to deal with hate and discrimination across society. It's not an abstract, it's just a different way it manifests itself. Right. Got, yeah, I've got, I've got nothing to add. Uh, Tonya's got one final... Yeah, I'm, I'm just on, on the final points that you were making there. I think it's naive of us to, to kind of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, sorry to <laughs> use his name, but, you know, their failure to allocate resources to police on like that online space, I think it's very naive of us to think that, you know, he has enabled the proliferation of misinformation and abuse, and that's what we've seen uh, on our platforms. So, um, you know... Thank you for your time, but, but really, you know, that, that's where I think the problem lies. Mm -hmm. And I think we shouldn't be that naive, which is why it's important that we do call them out as well. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for all the evidence you've given today to our um, current panel and our previous panel. It's been a very rich discussion and will hopefully contribute to making a better online and offline world. So Fingers crossed. Cheers. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.